Our next speaker is Professor Zhao Sosa um, from uh, Porto University, and he will be talking to us about um, his uh, presentation titled From Vehicles to Teams in Marine Operations. Please welcome Professor Zhao Sosa. Okay, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Eric Ferron and the organization for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much. As you may have realized, I have a long name, but uh, I'm glad you just said João Souza. So <laughs> otherwise, we would spend the rest of the presentation just describing the name. So today, I'm going to talk about vehicles and teams. And what you see here in the background is already some of the motivation for my talk, which is uh, you can recognize, hopefully, Portugal there. This is the Iberian Peninsula. And this white line represents the outer limits of our claim to the extension of the continental shelf. And the question is how to have a sustained presence here. But uh, before discussing this, I would briefly like to discuss some related topic, which is this idea of. Um, change in an age of exponentials. So we have this quotation from Ray Kurzweil, it's from 2000, and basically it says that an analysis of the history of technology shows that technology technological change is exponential and contrary to the common sense intuitive linear view. And basically the returns such as uh, chip speed and cost effectiveness also increase exponentially. And the question is, what about marine robotics? Can we talk about exponential growth? I don't know, but we can look at a few examples. Uh, not necessarily a good example, but it's expanding. So uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, other examples? Uh, this is quite close to where we are right now. So we have Task Force 59 from US Navy. Uh, and the idea is to operate uh, close to 100 USVs in the area, uh, both in the uh, Red Sea and the uh, Persian Gulf. And uh, another example, uh, this one is kind of a Portuguese with an international flavor. So we've been organizing this exercise in cooperation with the Portuguese Navy, in cooperation with CMRE, and in cooperation with NATO Maritime Man Systems. And uh, the exercise is about um, uh, large-scale experimentation, evaluation, and testing in operational environments. Uh, one note, this is not a military exercise. So we do it in the triple helix. So we have um, industry, we have armed forces, and we have academia. And then we have several focus areas. I won't go into more details because I don't have enough time. So lots of toys, including the ones that you see in the background. And But the thing that I wanted to highlight here is this, which is... Uh, so this has been growing a lot. Last year we had 27 navies, uh, a significant number of uh, UAVs, USVs, close to 60 AUVs and warships and other support vessels. So numbers are increasing in a lot. Uh, another example, still quite different, but still relevant for what I wanted to discuss. 
uh, this project, uh, it's a EU project, it's over. Uh, so we have 15 of some of the key players in marine robotics in Europe, as you can see. So Portuguese, uh, Portugal has a strong presence there. So Antonio was there, I was there. And the project really went very well. So we had three times of a, three types of activities. So what we call transnational access, uh, meaning that we would provide access to all of these toys for free under open calls. Uh, then we had GRA, so making systems more operable. And then we had networking. And uh, just in terms of TNA, transnational access, so we had 53 TNA projects, and some of those were quite complex. And so we had applications from academia, industry, government, research uh, in this, uh, institutes. And in blue, you see locations of the partners. And the good thing is that we could get applications from all over the world. And in the other colors, you see applications for, from institutions basically all over the world. So this is a good example of cooperation and also of scaling. And now kind of a ocean will be implemented through the creation of a vast global scale network of sensors from seabed through the ocean surface to space across millions of miles. It includes unmanned surface vessels, subsea sensors, satellites, ships, buoys and drones. It builds on the assets we already have and creates an interconnected mesh of immediate data and communication fused together with AI algorithms, computer vision, and acoustic analysis technologies powered by machine learning, all coming together to create a multinational advanced ocean management platform, the digital ocean. A digital ocean will help us mitigate... Okay, so... There's more, but I need more time. So, and this is an overview of the talk. So I'll start by describing what we do in our lab, just briefly describing that. And then since we discussed this yesterday, kind of a trajectory planning and their uh, currents, I'll do that. Then I'll go into vehicles and teams, and then I'll discuss some of the enabling technologies for being able to develop and deploy teams. So interoperability and interchangeability, mobile connectivity and mobile locality, very important. Then an example, and then I will briefly discuss formal models for teamed vehicles and some conclusions. So starting with uh, our lab, and this is our vision for a sustained presence in the ocean. So multiple assets, lots of different types of interactions. You may have seen this before. Uh, sensing links, uh, mixed initiative interactions, meaning operators in the planning and control loops. Vehicles may come and go. Same thing with the operators. Uh, the issue of scalability. Right now we know how to operate, let's say 10, 15 assets. What about more than that? Question mark. Uh, we use vehicles as data mules. The issue of distributed computation, which is becoming very relevant right now. Uh, what we call physical mobile locality, being able to have vehicles launching and recovering other vehicles. And in our vision, we would like to treat this ensemble as a system that has properties that are a function of the vehicles, a function of the communication networks, and a function of the interactions that you establish there. And in the end, we, we want the system to have organization-like properties. Uh, sorry. Go back. One, two. Sorry. I want to go back. So these are some of our toys. Uh, we've been designing and building most of them. Some of them we bought. So we bought a, an Aquanaut. We have a glider there and we're getting more. And then we have some exotic vehicles. For example, this one takes off and lands from water. It's a flying modem. Uh, what we have here for marine biologists uh, is basically a sampler of the surface micro layer. And then we have other toys. The important thing is that all of these guys share part of the same computational hardware and use 
the same software. So they are interoperable. This is our workhorse, uh, two versions, uh, upper water column, uh, endurance 60 hour plus, and then again, a version with a camera, support for multi-vehicle operations, and there's a spin-off which puts those in the market. Uh, a more kind of exotic uh, vehicle, uh, which is a quadcopter, octocopter that can take off and land from water. And the interesting thing is that you can deep an acoustic modem in the water, meaning that you can communicate with submerged assets. This is the main reason why we developed this. So in terms of what we've been doing, we've been developing a software tool chain. We start with Dune that runs on board. Then we have IMC, which is a protocol. So all vehicles talk the same protocol. Then we have Naptus, which runs on your laptop. And basically it's for command and control. And then we have Ripples, which is the net expression of Naptus. And then you can talk about the software enabled network vehicle system. Uh, op areas, we've been operating in lots of different places. There's just a small mistake here because we've also been in the Persian Gulf, but not here. We've been doing some archeological surveys in Sarjad. I, I hope I got the pronunciation right. Uh, we have a spin-off, as I mentioned, nothing really special. Front page of Science Robotics, February 21. And now let me briefly talk about this because this was alluded to before yesterday. So we were given the following problem by the Portuguese Navy. So this is a river. This is an estuary of the river. There is a peninsula here. There is a target there. And the idea is to be able to select a location in a time to be able to launch a vehicle that, uh, uh, an UV that would enter the estuary and go to this location. Keep in mind that currents here are quite strong and vehicles may not be able to overcome this, uh, these currents. So the formulation is pretty standard except for a few. Uh, so you have, uh, we consider planar trajectories. We could consider uh, uh, 3D trajectories, but for the moment that's it. So we have some initial time and position, and we want to find a trajectory minimizing some cost function and reaching some target. Uh, keep in mind that along the trajectory, we have perturbations coming from currents. So in these perturbations can be pretty strong. We also have, and it's not incorporated here, obstacles such as bathymetry, which depends on the tides. Uh, and the approach, so we use basically dynamic programming, and then we have the solver of the hamilton jacobi bellman equation based on the fast sweeping method, which was also developed there. And now let's look at some of the results. Let's forget about the equations and look, so, look at the results. So the value function depends on x, y, and t, because currents depend on t. So what you have here is a sort of a slice of the value function, and these lines, these are kind of iso lines of the value function. The meaning is that if you leave from this point, from any of the point in this line, you reach the target exactly at the same time. It also means that these iso lines are separated by time. So if you want to uh, have some vehicles leaving from here and some vehicles leaving from here, you just need to take the take the time difference between these two ISO lines to get there at the same time. But we can do more, something very simple. So imagine that looking at the same uh, value function, you have X, Y, and T, and you minimize in T. Meaning that this gives you this kind of a, this is a kind of cover coded, but it tells you that to reach that location, if you leave from this area, this is where you get the maximum gain in terms of velocities. We also run some uh, real examples and some simulations. Uh, one example, uh, 13 kilometers, velocity gain 28%, and the ETA between the real time of arrival and the predicted one was less than two minutes. Uh, some examples of optimal trajectories. And it's also interesting to look at something that may be relevant to you. So 
So you have the optimal trajectories, and here we superimposed the vectors representing the speed of the current. And as you see, those make sense. So speed here is pretty low, then these guys benefit from the tides. So, and this is exactly what we've been doing. But we went one step further. Then again, I don't want to go into details because there's a lot about this. But imagine the following problem. You have a ship that has to deliver two AUVs at two different locations that are unknown. And at the same time, the times of delivery are also unknown. And you want to do this in some optimal fashion. So when you release them, then they should go to some destinations also in some optimal fashion. And we came up with a way of solving this using uh, what is called basically three dynamic programming. So starting from the, the, the end, starting in terms of a discrete world. And then by doing that, we were able to concatenate value functions to be able to find the optimal solution to this problem. Uh, I won't say more about this. Then again, if you want to go into more details, please don't. Uh, hesitate and talk to me. Now let's talk about vehicles and systems. Uh, first of all, we can say that a vehicle, just for the sake of this discussion, is a platform, a payload and mechanical interfaces, C3 systems, software and computations. Uh, and it, which is exactly, sorry, what you have here. And then you can have some technical features. And then you can have some examples of real, ve real vehicles, uh, AUVs, ASVs, UAVs, whatever. And the important observation is that if you pick those randomly, what happens is that those guys are not compatible in the sense that they are not able to talk to each other, okay? So, which is typically the case. So most COTS vehicles were not designed for interactions or integration in a, into a team. So we need compatible communications. We need interoperability standards. We need an operational environment which is compatible and potentially launch and recovery. So if you go to Teams, sorry, I want to go back. So you have to be careful, sorry, about compatibility. So these guys are able to talk to each other and they use the same communications protocol, in this case, cattle. And there's more to it, but uh, if you take this matrix of capabilities, then you can get a vector of team capabilities. And then a team can be described as a set of vehicles, a set of capabilities, a network infrastructure, inputs, commands, outputs, team controllers, a transition function for the state of the system. And then we have several design challenges. For example, we want to deliver these capabilities. We want to impose some safety constraints that are derived from these capabilities. And we want to see the, the team to satisfy new properties, resilience or in agility, reconfiguration, uh, being able to play with the control authority and flexibility. One observation, which I think is quite relevant coming from the Swarms people. Uh, this is from Marco Dorigo and his uh, friends. And he realized that while Swarms uh, Robotics takes inspiration from self-organizing systems, Future robot swarms should include hierarchical forms of control beyond self-organization to deal with the assignment of larger responsibilities to a few individual task allocation, the creation of task-oriented teams, and the coordination of specific activities. So basically, this is exactly what we are discussing, teams. Uh, first of all, interoperability in interchangeability without going into details, just one example. Uh, this was demonstrated in the rep exercise 2019. So we had a couple of uh, AUVs underwater, some from us, some from the uh, and, uh, 
the Naval and Sea Warfare Centers, sorry, uh, running different software, but talking the same language. We had the WAMV and the Seabed node from the University of Hawaii. This guy had the um, communications gateway, and then you had a control station. And the control station could either send commands to the communication gateway that would send commands to the vehicles, or could send those to the flying modem that would land close to the seabed node. Those will be transferred to the seabed node. And then these vehicles would go by the seabed node to extract mission plans or other uh, instructions from the seabed node. So this is an example of interoperability using diverse uh, vehicles. Uh, in last year, we went, we were a bit more ambitious. So let me try to explain what we were doing, interacting with lots of different assets. So these were our vehicles. So we had ripples in the cloud. We had operators using ripples. And then we were able to interact with our vehicles using either Naptus directly or using setcoms. And we had a way of interacting with the rest of the world. So we were able to interact through REST uh, APIs or something like that, able to interact with vehicles using cattle or having a kind of a data fetcher, a data feeder, short to ship communications, etc. So this was one way to interact with other vehicles. The other way was directly through what we call the IMC, IMC is our protocol, so the IMC broker translator. So other vehicles could have this uh, broker translator, and these could talk directly to our systems. If not, they could talk using the REST, uh, the REST uh, uh, API. Uh, ripples, so basically for situational awareness, you have to know what's going on in the geography. So sometimes you're operating in large areas. And then we also have to basically, sorry again, know where vehicles are, what are they doing, and also get access to data collected by these vehicles. And you can do this using ripples. And you can do this from anywhere in the world. Now, let's switch to a different topic enabling technology, mobile connectivity, and mobile locality. And I think that this quotation from Robin Milner, he was a Turing Award and his Turing Award lecture, it's really worth reading, especially because it's very interesting and very relevant. But then after a while you think, hey, there are other ways of doing the same thing. So dynamic reconfiguration is a common feature of communicating systems. And the theories of computation are evolving from notions like value evaluation and function to those of link interaction and process. And especially links are very important to us. So without going into detail, so we introduced the PI calculus, which is a calculus of communicating systems in which agents of a system may be arbitrarily linked and the communication over linked neighbors may carry information which carry which changes that linkage. So a process, a computational process, is an abstraction of an independent thread of control. A channel is, is an abstraction of a communication link between two processes. And processes interact with each other by sending and receiving messages over channels. Moreover, you can pass channels from one process to another. This is very nice, but has some problems. Does not handle mobile locality. So imagine that your computation is running here and then you would have to run it on that computer. Uh, there's an implicit assumption on permanent communication availability and uh, it's kind of hard to map to the physical reality. Another important topic, mobilities. So you're familiar with control mobility, data mobility, link mobility, object mobility, and then two important mobilities for teams of vehicles operating in the world, which is mobile computation, which has to do with virtual mobility, mobile software, 
but also mobile computing, which has to do with mobile hardware. So moving hardware to locations where it's needed. Uh, and so Robin Milner decided to address all of these challenges uh, to try to model all of these. So he came up with this theory and it's evolved from process calculi. Uh, and you have systems of autonomous agents interacting and moving among each other and within each other. So this is a bigraph. And a biograph, it's very interesting because basically you have two types of graphs, what they call a place graph, a forest as a structure of a forest and explains the mobile locality. And then you have a link graph explaining how these guys are connected. And then this represents the state of the system and the state of the system can change with time. If something happens, then you have the redex, which explains the state of the system right now. And then you have a new biograph. So this is very nice, but has lots of limitation and lacks the dynamic systems view. Of course, you can also talk about uh, dynamical networks of hybrid automata without coming into lots of details. So you have a graph in which each, each node is a hybrid automaton and then links uh, point to other nodes and talk about interactions. And this structure can change with time. Let's forget about this. And now uh, let me briefly talk about putting some of these technologies together. You may have seen these last year, but I think it's also worth talking about it this year. So we had these crews, sorry, uh, funded by the Schmidt Ocean Institute, uh, a big team, and we had the support of several interesting institutions. So for example, NASA Ames and Sintef. Um, uh, and we went after the Northern Pacific Subtropical Front. So basically there were several studies in the 60s and the 70s, and these are ship lines from these studies. And this is something very interesting. You don't need to be an oceanographer to understand what's going on here. So this is distance and this is depth. And salinity, you have isolines for salinity and temperature. And you really don't need to be an expert to tell that there's something going on here and here. And basically there's a Northern Pacific subtropical front and subarctic front. So these waters don't mix. So the main goal of the cruise was to demonstrate all of these technologies working together. I just said a video, I'll make it shorter. During this expedition, our team has created a system to conduct oceanographic surveys with unprecedented levels of detail and scale. Approximately 1,000 miles off the coast of Southern California, we are studying the subtropical front. Here, two masses of water collide, which generate a unique mix of physical, chemical and biological features. Before the expedition, autonomous vessels helped us determine the approximate location of the front. When we arrived here, we deployed CTDs to gain a more precise understanding of its spatial dynamics. Our autonomous underwater vehicles, which were specifically designed for this expedition, can cover hundreds of kilometers and stay in the water for up to 50 hours. They travel in a yo-yo pattern, sending real-time data back to the ship every time they surface. Our fixed-wing vertical takeoff UAVs can fly faster and further than quadcopters and carry a variety of sensors. The data our autonomous vehicles collect helps us locate biological hotspots where we conduct more detailed sampling. We are deploying very advanced technology that needs to be refined through experimentation and by doing that we hope to establish some of the foundations for the future of oceanographic surveys. And so this is the architecture, computational and software architecture of the system that we were using. So we had the Falcor, we had Ripples, 
So we had control stations on the Falcor and on shore, and we were using SATCOMs to connect all of these. So we had a mission control center in port and another one on the Falcor. Uh, I think I'll skip this. Uh, we used sail drones and a wave glider to find the front, basically looking at um, changes in salinity and temperature and trying to find the signature of the front, and we were able to do that. Uh, we also had uh, a prototype of a DMS sensor for, for marine biologists. Uh, this means a lot. So this is a sensor that's a, sort of a byproduct of biological activity. And actually you could tell that there's a peak of concentrations of DMS when you're close to the front. And this is part of what we did. I don't have much time to explain what was going on. This was the only SST data that we got during that expedition. The front is here and there was a filament attaching from the front. Here we measured currents of up to two knots. And what you have here, these lines represent trajectories of our AUVs color coded by salinity. And there's a very nice uh, correlation between them. We also performed automated front uh, detection and tracking. We also had the formation flying to characterize the ocean and what's above the ocean flying UAVs <laughs> over the, the Falcor. And then some data. So in the background, you have uh, finite re and off uh, exponents. And there's an interesting correlation between that and tracks of some of the assets and currents and also SST data. And so we take all these different systems that go beyond the footprint of what a ship can do. They can be 20 miles this way, 20 miles that way, and help us understand the oceans a lot better than we do now. Yeah, I just need two minutes, okay? So um, I'll briefly say something about formal model for uh, themed vehicles. These are inspired in the actor model from Carl Hewitt. As I mentioned before, a vehicle is composed of several different uh, subsystems. You could have different vehicles. They can communicate eventually. If they can communicate, then you can take advantage of those communications. And basically, then you can start thinking about doing things. I'll skip this for the moment. But the interesting thing is that, first of all, you can basically send uh, processes from one vehicle to another vehicle. We can compose processes and we can also make communications with these two vehicles uh, not feasible for other vehicles. And then you can create what is called a team, which is based on all of these operations. Then uh, later on, we can play with multiple teams. And I think I'll skip this. There's no need to do this. But then again, this tells you how several different vehicles in teams can interact if they have the right controllers and the right uh, uh, communications and they are configured in a decent way. I'll skip this. And basically, the design problem, sorry, consists of having a specification for a set of vehicles and the specification could be done graphically, uh, synthesize a set of computational entities to be composed with the vehicles to satisfy the specification. So we need a notion of behavior equivalence and basically we need to address some properties, continuation, information reachability, you want information to reach some vehicles because you don't have uh, perfect information. You have termination, well posedness and encapsulation. So some conclusions, exponential growth, don't know, but there's a significant trend. Some of the showstoppers are not technical. For example, interoperability is not a technical problem. It's more of a political problem, people agreeing on interoperability. And we need to accelerate the development cycle, hence uh, our exercise with multiple uh, vehicles. 
And this way, we would really like to achieve a sustained presence in the Atlantic. So one step at a time, but still, we think that this is quite feasible. Thank you very much.